All right. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, also, thanks everyone else for uh, taking some time today to uh, attend uh, today's uh, talk. I hope it's a talk that you will find uh, interesting. Uh, it's always a, been a talk of interest to me uh, with my background uh, in the Air Force Reserves. Um, certainly for objectives today, we're going to uh, look kind of broadly at a couple items. We're going to discuss the role of, of public health in national security and then also uh, towards the end of the talk, uh, discuss some enhanced collaboration uh, capability building recommendations for the current uh, U.S. biodefense preparedness. And I think, you know, coming off the heels of COVID, it certainly has um, added to this discussion and really is what drove a lot of my interest in this topic. You know, as a Air Force officer, I've always uh, had interest in the health and medical side of, of my service, but never really uh, was thrust into a true public health um, role until the beginning of COVID when my role as a critical care uh, and a nurse practitioner uh, for the reserve kind of changed into more of a public health emergency officer. And it was really that kind of experience that drove me into uh, getting my MPH and then certainly um, kind of further my interest in this particular topic. So I do have a couple of disclaimers for today. Uh, first, uh, the views within this presentation are those of my own. They don't reflect the official policy or position of the US government nor the Department of Defense. And secondly, all the information that we're going to talk about today is either unclassified or public domain. So we're not violating any, any security clearances, anything like that. So when we think about um, national security, uh, this is oftentimes probably some of the images and, and things that oftentimes when you ask people what national security is, this is probably what they come up with. Uh, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, terrorism, um, intelligence, spying, uh, on the upper left here, obviously, you have our uh, policymakers sitting in the war room talking about some event that's going on. Uh, but what most people don't often have an appreciation for, um, and maybe certainly a little bit more appreciation for now, was what's the role of public health in particular as we look at national security? And it's an interesting topic in that when you talk national security within the circles of either scholars from um, political science, um, and just uh, kind of national security in general, there's always been a little discourse of like, does public health or um, health related issues really rise to the same level as, as national security, which is predominantly oftentimes seen as military power and projection globally in, in uh, pursuit of our national interest. And so as we look at national security, uh, one of the first things we kind of need to define are some definitions up front to kind of um, set the stage for the conversation today. And Part of that is what is actually a national security threat? Um, I mean, how does that relate to national security? Um, so as we look at threats, we first have to, again, make a big distinction here between what is truly national security, uh, which really, again, is the ability of a nation to protect its own national interests from external threats. So putting the needs of one state over another, essentially, uh, in that regard. Um, contrast that with, with what's oftentimes called global health security, and, and these terms will get used inter twined, which they're actually quite a bit different between the two. When we look at global health security, we're really talking about the global health um, of benefiting all people within around the globe. And so it's that bigger uh, picture of, of doing um, good for everyone uh, as opposed to one state over there, like national security. And so if you look at national security threats, what this is really based on is a lot of the doctrine that comes from um, the Department of Defense, our, our armed forces. And so what I've done today is really taken a pretty convoluted web of doctrine and just kind of pared it down to uh, more specifically looking at biodefense. And one of the uh, doctrine in which our national security threats is based upon is called our national security strategy. And what that really is, is a, it's a report that's produced by um, each administration um, that conveys their um, national security vision, their goals, their objectives um, from the executive branch or to Congress and the legislative branch. And that's oftentimes what lays out their priorities. And certainly with most of these, there is a component of bio uh, defense and um, the um, protection against uh, bio threats. The most recent one from uh, the Biden administration, just to kind of pull out the bio defense piece of it, really speaks to preparing for of biological risks by improving not only data sharing, um, early warning systems, um, biomedical surveillance, uh, medical countermeasures, just to name a few. And a lot of that has really been refined after uh, the experience of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so 
as we go back to what is considered a national security threat, it really can be defined um, as any systemic threat to the domestic, regional, or global health or safety of our nation. Uh, it can be threats to political, civil, or economic securities. And what it requires is some significant additional resources and planning and action by the U.S. government. And so one of the difficult things with any time you're going to talk about national security is a lot of the information tends to be classified. And that is certainly the case here at national security threats when it comes to uh, infectious disease in particular. Um, there are a few kind of known national security threats like H1N1, uh, Ebola, but for the most part, most national security threats of the general uh, sense are classified information. But what we do know uh, when we think about national security is that all countries do have a um, vulnerability to infectious diseases. And we certainly saw that with COVID, you know, an epidemic in one country soon can be the epidemic in yours, or in the case of COVID became a pandemic. Um, and this is where I think um, health or public health really ties into the importance for national security in that uh, disease outbreaks really have the potential for um, creating some threat to national security. When you think about the outcomes that can come from a, a significant uh, disease outbreak, whether it's illness, whether it's death of the citizens of that nation, uh, whether it is um, economic and political stability, instability, I should say, um, creating panic, creating social unrest, all that of which uh, we certainly saw during COVID. And so uh, I think that's where, you know, really the conversation comes back to, yeah, public health really is part of national defense when you think about it from those terms. There are also what are called uh, national security priorities. And these are still high on the radar, um, but oftentimes can be kind of framed in the sense, these are potential humanitarian, economic, or political losses that um, really require heightened national attention. So they don't quite rise to the level of a national security threat, but certainly are of concern to our policymakers and the, the uh, safety of our country. And this is where a lot of the infectious diseases kind of fall uh, when you start looking at national security. Um, some examples that would fall under here would be things like um, MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome, uh, pandemic influenza, drug-resistant tuberculosis, um, SARS, some of those um, kind of respiratory outbreaks we've seen in the past. And so uh, when we look at national security priorities, again, they require some heightened attention, but it's really interesting if you look at uh, many of these, uh, when you start looking at infectious diseases, you know, if we look back historically, um, pandemics and epidemics have really changed civilizations. They really changed the trajectory of, of prior uh, wars throughout our time. Um, COVID certainly, again, has really illustrated that. And to even drive this further, I think what is important to recognize is in the Last half of the 20th century, we had 30 new human diseases that were identified, and that same trend is also applicable to our veterinary side of, of the fence. And if you really parse all this back and start looking at why is there so much more exposure to infectious diseases that are certainly concerning not only to national security, but also just to um, the general wellness of, of a, a society or its citizens, a lot of that can be brought back to human behavior, which certainly also drives a lot of the concerns we have with national security, um, whether it's war, whether it's conflict, whether it's economic or political, uh, most things that uh, create national security concerns are driven by human behavior. And so if you look at that from an infectious disease standpoint, you know, there are many things out there that whether they raise the level of national security priorities, um, they certainly raise to the level of, of humans having more exposure to diseases in which they may not have uh, significant immunity or the, the ability to um, defend themselves against. So we look at behaviors like, you know, political instability in war in countries. Uh, we look at the globalization of our food market. Uh, we look at, you know, unfortunately, this movement towards vaccine hesitancy, uh, creating some vulnerabilities in populations. Our global travel and trade. Uh, we look at, um, you know, habitat encroachment, certainly getting in, in exposed to uh, pathogens that we probably would not be exposed to had we not encroached on wildlife uh, habitat. Certainly, uh, there's been a, a driver uh, when we look at the um, difficulties with drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, you know, certainly a movement towards mega cities. When you look at countries like India, for example, and then a lot of agricultural practices, particularly with uh, heavy antibiotic use, uh, certainly all those things are producing um, pathogens in which uh, may create threats to humans. Now, again, not necessarily perhaps raising to the level of national security, but certainly of concern uh, when you start also looking at our forward deployed forces who are 
out in countries where um, perhaps there may be exposure because of the nature of the operations that they're conducting. The other thing we have to recognize as we look at national security is certainly the link between uh, terrorism and poverty and how that really relates to um, infectious disease outbreaks. And so as we look globally, and this is um, a couple of graphics taken from a RAND uh, Corporation um, publication that was uh, given permission for reprint was when we look globally at terrorism over the past few decades, there certainly has been a pretty big growth uh, within South Asia, the Middle East and North Africa. And Africa obviously being a very interesting uh, part of this puzzle right now, just with certainly the, the international tensions with China, this has become kind of a um, strategic uh, piece of land, if you will, or country, uh, when you start looking at kind of global positioning for um, prevention, deterrence, and other military operations. And so as we look at countries that have significant issues with terrorism and poverty, what it really stands out is when we look at the top 25 countries most vulnerable to an infectious disease outbreak due to a multitude of things like poor access to resources, poor governance, uh, weak health systems, which we know are all vulnerabilities to an outbreak. 22 of those 25 countries exist in Africa. And um, this is a kind of the infectious disease hotspot belt that's oftentimes referred to uh, in Africa. Um, the other three countries are Afghanistan, Yemen, and Haiti. So um, certainly areas of the world in which we, we have had and currently have um, operations ongoing um, from our military forces. Um, but what we know about countries who are impoverished or who have um, you know, lack of infrastructure, they also tend to have the inability to prevent terrorism and criminal networks from operating in their, their homeland. Uh, but it also compounds their ability to fight pandemic disease due to lack of economic and infrastructure development because of the ongoing either civil war or conflict ongoing in the countries. And uh, we certainly will, will kind of touch base on that as we get into uh, some of our information later in the talk about uh, some of the things found with the global health security uh, data. So the other thing we need to kind of define or put into context for the talk is what are some definitions we talked about biodefense. Um, I mentioned most of these conversations are very military centric in regards to military projection of power. Um, but when we look at biodefense, uh, we're really talking about actions in which we can counter bio threats, reduce our risk um, to them, and then prepare for recover from those events. Um, bio incidents are basically defined as any act of um, biological warfare or terrorism or a crime that involves a biohazard, uh, whether that's intentional um, or any natural accidental occurrence that harms our armed forces can be considered a bio incident um, in regards to our national security. Biological threats can be any entity in which a situation um, either involves a biohazard or one that could potentially cause a biohazard. And this has certainly really become a little bit more uh, prominent, uh, particularly with some of the events going on with Russia and Ukraine and certainly our, our international tensions with the uh, People's Republic of China. We certainly had some concerns uh, with North Korea as well. And so it's really driven uh, what we're going to talk about next, which is kind of this biodefense posture review that the U.S. has done here. Uh, and that review has been published here in the last month. And then finally, a biohazard is any biological agent um, or biologically active, active substance, if you will, regardless of the origin, um, that may represent an actual or potential threat to either humans, plants, animals, or the environment. And so those are just some definitions as we talk about some of that terminology going forward, um, just to kind of be aware of. So I mentioned that we've done a, a bio defense posture review, and this is all public domain information. You can go out and just find these documents. Um, but again, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the doctrine of, of national security is pretty, it's a complicated web and you know, there's a whole bunch of different um, kind of strategies and, and different um, plans. And so I've really just parsed this down to the, the three that we're really gonna focus on for today. And certainly uh, the first of that's the national defense strategy which kind of leads to the linkage between our national biodefense strategy as well as the most recent biodefense posture review that's been put out um, by our government. And so we look at national defense strategy. Um, this really is kind of the overarching goals of part of our national defense for our country. And there's really big four priorities right now um, that links to kind of our biodefense strategy. 
Um, number one is certainly defending the homeland, but to kind of keep pace with the multi-domain threat um, that's been posed kind of by uh, the People's Republic of China. And so, you know, there's threat from the air, threat from their Navy, um, nuclear, cyber, and then certainly there's some concern too about, is there a biologic component to this? Um, there's been some documents uh, that have been released uh, from um, the Pu People's Republic of China that really states their goal is to make China a le global leader in technologies like genetic engineering, um, precision medicine, and what they define as brain sciences. And um, they went as far as in that document to talk about, you know, biology is the new domain of war. And so that's certainly raised a little bit of concern, which has prompted uh, some of this biodefense posture review. Um, the second goal of the, our defense strategy is to deter strategic attacks against the U.S. and allies and partners. Um, the third goal is deterring aggression while being able to be um, prepared to prevail in conflicts when necessary with the prioritization of our kind of readiness first towards a threat um, from China uh, and then second, the uh, Russia challenge in Europe as they currently have ongoing in Ukraine. And the last uh, goal, of course, is to build a resilient um, joint force, which really means all of our armed force branches working together um, and to kind of build our um, defense ecosystem, and, you know, the ability to respond to bio threats in the event of an active conflict. And so um, some of that concern has also been driven by when we do try to um, look at countries, you know, cooperation, if you will, and compliance with what's called the Biological Weapons and Toxins Convention, um, certainly those uh, countries of North Korea, China, and Russia, we certainly have concerns about that. Um, there's certainly been longstanding concerns too since the USSR fell and became what is known as Russia now. You know, a lot of their bio, a lot of their biological weapons program kind of went um, missing, if you will. So um, certainly some concerns there. So we'll move on now and talk a little bit about the national defense strategy, which uh, really defines the Department of Defense's role for um, deterrence of a bioweapon and deliberate attack uh, from bioweapons, uh, which is really, again, they're the lead agency for this, but um, it also uh, outlines some of their goals on regards to a biodefense. And I'm gonna focus primarily on goal three um, as we go through the talk, uh, because I think that is one where when we think about national security, we oftentimes think about it again in, in the military sense and the government and um, kind of in those arenas. And really, I think national security kind of spills over into the civilian sector to a degree. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about that as we get towards the end of the talk here. But this was the um, National Biodefense um, Strategy, which was put out, I believe, in uh, 2022. Um, and these are really the goals. Uh, goal one, obviously, is to enable risk awareness and detection to inform decision making across the biodefense enterprise. Um, Number two is to ensure our biodefense enterprise capabilities to prevent bio incidents. Three is to, um, again, ensure preparedness is, is present to reduce impacts of bio events. And that really, again, gonna focus on that one because I think that ties into partnerships outside of the uh, government and military in regards to biodefense. And then certainly number four is to rapidly respond and limit the impact of, of bio events. Um, certainly biological attacks are of huge concern. Um, the other concern uh, from a bio uh, defense standpoint is certainly looking at some of those threats that really uh, apply to our deployed forces um, who are operating in you know, many countries around the world. A lot of those threats may not be necessarily bio weapon attacks or bio weapons uh, concerns, maybe things that are endemic they come in contact with. Uh, so you think about um, endemic diseases like tuberculosis, influenza, um, foodborne illnesses and waterborne illnesses like typhoid cholera or vector-borne like malaria and dengue. And that may seem a little bit of an odd, like how does this tie back to national security? Um, the concern is a lot of these organisms, uh, particularly when you look at multi-drug resistance uh, TB, some of the resistance that are um, developing due to uh, with malaria in regards to prophylaxis, you know, and medical countermeasures that our, our armed forces use in a lot of these environments that they operate in, uh, those may become ineffective at some point um, just due to uh, that natural progression of resistance. And so that obviously, again, is, is a considerable uh, part of our biodefense, even though it may not raise the level of bioweapons. Um, there's certainly been a lot of concern also um, in the number of uh, years recently, particularly regards biotechnology and biocontainment safety. 
And a lot of that goes back to some of the dual use research, you know, research that um, really has medical benefit, but also could be used for nefarious um, efforts as well, if, if desired. And so there's a lot of, that seems to be one of the big focal points right now is trying to figure out how do we keep that checks and balances for those particular uh, aspects. And the other thing that really is driving some of the national defense uh, review right now um, is just the importance of collaboration uh, with the international community, as well as the private sectors uh, to counter the full spectrum of bio threats um, and enhance our pandemic preparedness, and then certainly move towards this goal of um, global health security, if you will. And so, as I mentioned, there's uh, this document called the Biodefense Posture Review. This came out just recently here. And this, again, builds upon um, the foundations of that 2022 National Defense uh, Strategy and um, Biodefense uh, document we just looked at. This also um, kind of plays on to some of the lessons learned during the COVID pandemic since the DOD had a pretty substantial um, role in that uh, response just due to the lack of capabilities from um, the civilian sector. And so to kind of summarize the defense posture, this is really some of the big aims uh, of the review. Number one, certainly was to reform the DOD's current posture for future bio threats. Obviously our uh, focus from the Department of Defense, we've moved away from the global war on terror directly anyway in the Middle East to now the big focus, certainly you no know, um, China kind of Pacific region uh, with what's going on with, uh, with China, North Korea, Russia. Uh, we also wanna ensure that our biodefense currently kind of links with our national defense strategy uh, goals, as we talked earlier. Um, they're really looking at trying to assess what's the bio threat landscape now through 2035 uh, with COVID kind of being a um, interesting response for DOD. You know, I've been in the military for 19 years now and uh, as a reservist, and I cannot recall any time in my career where we have actually supplemented the civilian healthcare sector like we did in New York. Um, so kind of that defense support of civil authorities kind of mission. So some of the things that have come out of COVID also is the DOD kind of taking a look at what is our biodefense mission, which historically has been, you know, the lead role in deterrence and response to bioweapons. Um, but also what is our role for supporting other agencies, um, the civilian sector, things like that. And then obviously um, that's a big part of this is developing those collaborative um, relationships for entities outside of the DOD, uh, whether that be civilian or other uh, governmental agencies. So as we look at um, biodefense, the other thing we can't for lose focus of, um, because it does kind of tie back to infectious diseases, certainly some of the fallout from COVID. And this is from uh, February, 2022, uh, again, public domain information uh, from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. This is their annual threat assessment they put out from the intelligence uh, community that's uh, basically unclassified public information. These are some of the other, uh, obviously, issues that come with an infectious disease outbreak, or in this case, a pandemic known as COVID-19. Just some of the other follows. And so if you think back to what we talked about with the linkage between terrorism, poverty, and the inability to fight infectious diseases, um, there certainly is a lot of other tangibles here that will create potentially humanitarian economic crises for countries around the globe that obviously can influence our national security uh, depending on uh, the region and what's going on. So we know that there's probably gonna be some significant continued governmental strains, um, which will fuel humanitarian economic issues, political unrest and geopolitical uh, distress. And you know we've certainly have seen that over time, COVID certainly has magnified that. Um, one of the other concerns of some of these um, countries with lower levels of resources is what is the challenge to governments to try to maintain or gain back the human development they had to that point um, and how much of their prior uh, poverty levels are going to be exacerbated by um, the fallout from COVID. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about political instability. And then the other thing that's really uh, driven some concern globally besides the COVID pandemic um, there's just a lot of conflict around the world as well as concern for climate change, which has certainly driven a lot of food insecurity, which as we know, um, those 
um, kind of crises also tend to drive political economic instability, which then drives often more conflict and, and concerns for national security. And uh, this is interest. This is a very sad uh, statistic that um, you know food security has doubled from 135 million in 2019 to 270 million in 2020, and that was again uh, one of our threat reports from um, our intel community. And so this, again, is, I think, part of our bio threat environment of like, what is what is the tangible spinoffs of some of these uh, outbreaks when they do occur? Because COVID really illustrated um, the limitations um, significantly when you look at our local, state, national, international biodefense and or pandemic preparedness capabilities. Um, and again, the DOD got significantly involved with this due to um, the lack of insufficient capability um, in, you know, the civilian sector. And so... The DOD is really back and said, maybe we need to reevaluate um, what our response is and, and need to think more of, instead of it just being so DOD centric, do we need to bring in other government agencies and departments to work more collaboratively, more collaboratively with them um, so that we can balance, if you will, the support that we're given um, these other sectors, but also being able to maintain our primary mission set, which is obviously military power production globally through either you know, peacekeeping missions, contingencies, operations, and then obviously, you know, trying to keep pace with uh, some near-peer competitors. Um, when we talk about near-peer competitor, what we're talking about is um, a country that has very similar economic, political, and most importantly, military capabilities, which certainly um, Russia and China uh, kind of fit that, that mold. And so um, when we talk about near-peers, that certainly is a a new environment that uh, creates some new dynamics from the standpoint of national defense and even more complex if you in introduce a bio threat to that. And so we're gonna kind of talk a little bit now about just public health in general in regards to more of how does it relate to national security. And so if we look at public health, you know, as we look at the undertones and the, the advantages that come with having a really good public health system, versus some of the risks that come with having a lack of uh, infrastructure and good support for public health. These are really some considerations as you look at how public health may influence um, national security. Obviously, we know that lack of health and general well-being and, and such can create threats to political and social stability. Um, we know that it certainly can affect economics. Uh, when you think about military operations, and we certainly saw this during COVID, that it can weaken or diminish your military power. You know, we had an entire Navy um, ship that was was ill with COVID and basically was taken out of out of commission. It certainly impacted our ability to um, travel. Um, it certainly impacted our ability to send recruits and troops to training. Um, certainly, you know, when we think about diseases, they don't know borders. There is no, you know, passport for a disease. I mean, it doesn't, it can cross transnational borders. Um, it certainly is something that we cannot control. Um, oftentimes through the usual measures when we think about national security. Um, we also know that certainly human rights abuses and um, such come with, with poor infrastructure and, and in some of these are countries that lack um, good governance and, and, and lack access to health care. So a lot of things to consider with public health. And I think what sums this up very well is a quote from President Obama from 2016 uh, when he really drove the initiative of what we're going to talk about next, the global health security agenda. He said, promoting global health security is a core tenet of our national strategy for countering biologic threats. Uh, no single nation can be prepared if others remain unprepared to counter biological threats. And I think that really, to me, speaks to the importance of uh, public health as recognized as a tenet of national uh, security. Uh, we certainly have can think of many examples uh, during the COVID pandemic where this is certainly true as well and how vulnerabilities elsewhere uh, become your vulnerability tomorrow or your threat tomorrow, I should say. And so we're going to kind of transition to talking a little bit more about this global health security agenda and this global health security index, which is a um, assessment tool, because like, as I mentioned early in the talk, a lot of um, information as we talk about um, national security is classified. And so this was really kind of a nice surrogate to kind of give us a sense of looking at um, our current kind of preparedness posture a little bit outside of the, the DOD and something that's a little bit more tangible probably to the civilian sector, um, which certainly has a significant influence on many of the things we're going to talk about. So 
In uh, 2014, uh, President Obama during his administration started working on the Global House Security Agenda, which was finally then signed by executive order in 2016. And really uh, what this was designed for was to, again, approach that tenet of, of health security as part of our national security, and that it was to establish a global capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to biological threats and address future epidemic threats. And um, at the time, there were about, I think, 40 countries or so that signed on to this. And currently to date, there's 114 countries around the globe that have bought into this national security agenda, which really was um, a platform in which to drive some of the commitment towards the World Health Organization, moving to a global kind of health security environment. Um, and what it really allows countries to do is move towards that target of global health security for all by investing in capacities of either infrastructure, equipment, skilled personnel, you know, kind of working as a global community to kind of secure all of our, our health securities by meeting certain target guidelines. And you can kind of see here over the years, um, we're certainly moving that direction. 2020, we had uh, 56 countries of those 114 have met uh, what they define as target goals. And we'll, we'll kind of get into that next. Um, and then we have 20 close to the target and the rest certainly are not, not reaching that target. And so um, again, it's an ongoing um, kind of continuous improvement process. And uh, we certainly got a glimpse into how well we are doing with some of these preparedness activities because we certainly lived through that with, with the COVID pandemic. And that certainly unmasked a lot of vulnerabilities that we maybe didn't realize we had or magnified uh, those that were already pre-existing. And so how do we measure that? Uh, or how do we get a sense of that since most of our DOD national security stuff is classified? Uh, what I had done was kind of look through what's called the Global House Security Index. And this is a kind of comprehensive assessment tool that was put together by a, a group or number of groups, I should say, as kind of a, a consortium. And that was uh, what, it's called the Nuclear Threat Initiative. They're kind of a nonpartisan um, nonprofit group that looks at um, nuclear threats in particular. Uh, John Hopkins uh, School of uh, Public Health and their Center for Health Security um, was part of this. And then another group called the Economic uh, Impact Group. Uh, so they were the ones that really looked at a lot of public domain information, um, various uh, sources of information, various sources of data, and they really broke this down into what they call the Global Health Security Index. And what this includes is 195 countries which belong to the World Health Organization, um, international health regulations. Um, and they really developed this tool uh, based on what they considered pillars of health security. Um, so these are um, pieces of health security which can help you um, stabilize, prepare, respond, and recover from a um, pandemic, epidemic, or disease outbreak of significance. And it, it really was a pretty multifaceted um, index. There were six total categories, which are these six on the left here, prevent, detect, respond, um, healthcare access, international norms, and risk environment. And subsequently, those categories really devolved into, you know, 37 what they call indicators with a bunch of sub indicators, which are kind of questions with under questions. Ultimately, this index had about 171 questions that looked at these six different uh, pillars of security. And so what this allows someone to do is, to, again, kind of use this as a surrogate tool, but allows you to kind of analyze your own nation's, you know, global health security and its related capabilities. Um, you can measure in capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to a disease outbreak. You can use it to assess your health system preparedness for outbreaks uh, while considering other socioeconomic political variables that may create um, you know, global health security uh, vulnerabilities within your nation. The hope for this index was for that policymakers could then use this to look at the vulnerabilities they have and address those through either budget allocations to meet that need, um, look at spending decisions, setting public policy, uh, those types of things. And this has um, had two renditions of this. The first uh, report came out in 2019, so just prior to the pandemic. And then the second report uh, or analysis was done in 2021. So we'll, we're ways into the pandemic and you know gave people an opportunity to make some adjustments, if you will, to 
um, what was going on at the COVID pandemic at that point, since it was very obvious by then what a lot of the vulnerabilities were for many countries. So what I did is kind of just parse some of this out for discussion purposes today. And I broke down, um, obviously, the U.S. and then just some comparison countries of various different income statuses and then gave us the global averages on the bottom. And so to put this in the context of scoring for this, zero is the worst score you can get, which basically means those capabilities are non-existent, and 100 is the best. And um, this index, which certainly there are a lot of intricacies to the indicators, sub-indicators, and the questions, which I won't get into the details of those uh, too far uh, for just time's sake and, and just simplicity of the discussion. Um, but a lot of the, the scores within those categories were weighted. And, and so if you really want to uh, see the methodology for that, it is available on the uh, Global Health Security Index.org um, website. Um, but when we look at preparedness as a whole, you know, we look at those six different pillars. Um, these are the global averages along the bottom. And so what I will tell you of the 195 countries, the United States was the top country in regards to its overall um, Global Health Security Index. And what I hope to do in the next number of slides, though, is to take a little deeper dive into that um, to kind of illustrate some of the vulnerabilities we do have, in particular to relation to what's oftentimes called the paper plan syndrome. When you look at preparedness, um, countries develop plans, they put them on paper, they look great. Um, but really, sometimes it gives us a, a false illusion that we actually are prepared. And in fact, when we execute that um, plan, on paper, we find that there are many vulnerabilities, and that certainly was uh, the case and has always been the case. We always learn something from some sort of um, emergency response, in this case, the COVID pandemic. So overall score, when you take all these categories together, um, global average was 38.9, so a pretty low tier. And these tiers are kind of broken up into uh, categories of 20, so 0 to 20, 21 to 30, et cetera. Um, you can see our overall score is 75.9, which made us the top uh, country within this index. Uh, and then certainly we've broken this down into the individual categories as well. And so if we look at prevention, uh, prevention is a category that was designed to kind of give somebody the ability to address or assess their ability to address things like antimicrobial resistance, zoonotic diseases, um, biosecurity, biosafety, um, promoting a um, dual use research culture of responsibility. And what was interesting about this, um, almost all countries, um, including the US, had no emphasis in their um, kind of biosecurity, biodefense plans to specifically address zoonotic diseases, which was a little bit alarming, I think, from the standpoint when you think about zoonotic diseases are oftentimes those which drive many of our epidemic and pandemic type potential uh, outbreaks. So I thought that was an interesting piece um, when you look at it from that standpoint. Um, obviously, antimicrobial resistance is a really big problem as well. Um, overall, we did fairly well in that category. Um, no country of the 195 lower in that top tier. Um, and a lot of it had to do with, um, again, the lack of of um, zoonotic disease uh, emphasis. And then certainly a lot of countries were kind of in that middle range when it comes to biosecurity and biosafety. And a lot of that had to do with, you know, have you minimized the amount of bio um, um, hazardous labs, those containment labs to the minimum footprint needed and, and certainly policies and procedures in place to kind of have that checks and balances. Detection reporting was really a uh, indicator to kind of measure the strength of your lab system nationally. Um, in the event of a um, significant disease outbreak or a pandemic, uh, it looked at lab supply chains, it looked at your ability to do case investigation, um, the strength of your epidemiology workforce were just some examples of indicators um, under that. And, and what was interesting um, for the US, even though we had a fairly high score overall, um, and a lot of that was due to our really robust epi epidemiology workforce, uh, we did have some pretty significant um, vulnerabilities though, when it comes to um, our lab capabilities, certainly a large part of that, which I think we've made some strides to try to address after COVID was the lack of ability to scale up operations and capability uh, to do mass te um, testing and make the supplies available. Um, certainly detection capability is a concern, uh, particularly with a, a new pathogen 
Um, one of the big things that really stuck out to me as well was our lack of information sharing nationally, our capacity to share information. A lot of that goes back to our current kind of siloed um, healthcare system. We don't have necessarily a national public health system where um, the medical community and public health were able to really share information across um, their communities. And that was a really big um, problem for the US in regards to this category, as many other countries. Um, and like many other countries, we certainly struggled with contact tracing support. It just got so overwhelming and cumbersome just due to the lack of, of infrastructure to kind of make that happen. So those were some of the big barriers um, for the U.S., even though overall their score looks great. There certainly were pretty significant indicators where I would say, um, you know, have some pretty significant impact when you look at um, the ability to respond to a pandemic or a large scale uh, disease outbreak in the future. Rapid response really had to do with a country's ability to respond to and mitigate disease spread. And uh, this had a lot to do with their um, emergency operations, their emergency response planning. Um, and what was interesting um, of all 195 countries in this, only 35% had a national emergency response plan. So we obviously have one at the, in the US, you know, we call our national response framework, which brings in um, all of our kind of government agencies and, and how we respond to a, a, a emergency event. Uh, what was interesting though, um, and we certainly learned this in, uh, with COVID, some of the benefits of, of partnering with our, our, our private and civilian sectors, um, very few countries, including the U.S., had any evidence that they involved the private sector in their um, preparedness exercises. You know, most kind of large scale national um, whether disaster response or a pandemic response uh, exercises usually tend to involve just governmental and uh, federal agencies. And there was very little in the terms of involving the private sector, which is we found during COVID a very important resource uh, as we looked at you know, mass producing vaccines and things like that. Um, under rapid response also falls the role of what's called risk communication. So our ability to um, provide messaging to the nation or to your citizens of your nation in regards to risk and concerns during a um, disease outbreak, emergency event, whatever the case may be. And um, the U.S. had a plan, uh, as many countries did, uh, but was pretty poorly executed uh, when you evaluated. In fact, that was one of our uh, lowest scores in this category as we uh, received a zero for one of the sub indicators, which was um, was there evidence of misinformation being delivered by senior leaders, in this case, i.e. your president or your minister of health? Um, and I think certainly if we think back to the politics of our nation at that time, we certainly can see the um, negative influence of, of divisive politics or misinformation. Uh, and so that becomes really important when you think about national security in the terms of social unrest and um, just panic in general or in regards to public health, people's willingness to comply with um, with measures, and that has to do with messaging. You know, we have a tendency on all facets of our nation, whether it's in academia, public health, um, scholarly circles, um, with during events like COVID, our messaging tends to go from here's an event, and we go to apocalyptic messaging and and kind of this kind of um, really. Um, dark messaging, and that creates a lot of panic and unrest in, um, in emergency events. And so oftentimes the problems are not so much the harm from the pathogen, it's the harm from the human behavior that results of the messaging. That was certainly a thing that was really illustrated uh, over and over um, in, in a lot of uh, kind of after action reports um, after COVID. What I did pull together um, just for conversation pieces, um, was kind of a scatter plot here. Uh, we, I pulled together the um, countries from the index as well as the COVID-19 mortality per 100,000. And so you know, it's basically is a way to kind of look at a correlation of one variable against another. In this case, looking at their global health security index score. Um, so what you traditionally would see um, is, you know, one variable affecting another. So you may say, well, gosh, how does um, a country who sent, there tends to be this focal point here in this lower quadrant of low global health security index. So, you know, a really, um, you know, underperforming or lack of uh, resources in those categories. 
how does the country have all of these low scores, but yet not have a huge mortality in COVID-19 since, you know, we know that infrastructure and the ability to respond, is, they're kind of related. Um, this really illustrates the point of what happens when you have the lack of infrastructure, um, you have the inability to um, surveil, detect, and report disease. And that's what you're seeing here is many countries lack those capabilities. That's why their score is low and their mortality looks low on paper, but in reality is probably much higher just from the simple fact that they couldn't report and detect the disease uh, in their country. Um, and so that obviously opens up some concerns for um, you know, our, our overall global environment and community as far as safety goes related to infectious diseases. The next couple of slides are, are just some kind of areas I parsed out from um, this index again, and I really want to illustrate just some things that on the surface may seem like it's great, but on reality, there are some significant vulnerabilities that exist in the U.S. in particular. Uh, so that's the one I'm mainly focusing on is our U.S. defense posture. Um, when you look at the U.S., when you look specifically at their healthcare system score, or healthcare access, our overall score was a 75. And so that took, you know, all questions and considerations under that, which looked at, you know, um, health capacity from clinics, hospitals, and community care centers. It looked at supply chains for healthcare workers. It looked at medical countermeasures and, um, you know, dispensing of those. It looked at access to healthcare. It looked at infection control practices, and it looked at the capacity to, you know, kind of abruptly approve uh, medical countermeasures as they needed. And so um, as you look at this, um, the global average for the healthcare system is a 55. Um, we scored a 33.5. Um, so this is by far probably one of our more significant um, concerns um, when you start looking at um, our healthcare system, because on paper, you'd say, well, gosh, you know, if you just look at it from the superficial value, 75 is good. But if you parse this down into some of the sub indicators, um, our access to healthcare um, is certainly pretty poor compared to other countries. You know, when you look at um, the kind of constitutional right to medical care, i.e. a universal healthcare system is usually what they're getting at here. So you can see the global average of 55 and we scored a 33. So we're in one of the lower tiers for that. And I think that just speaks to some of the difficulties with our healthcare system and the way our current healthcare delivery model works in the U.S. Um, we certainly got the big zero for constitutional right to medical care. Um, when you look at out-of-pocket expense, we scored a 52. Um, so if you look at kind of the high-income countries, uh, we were 55 of 59 in that category as far as out-of-pocket expense. So again, if you have access to care, oftentimes it's very expensive uh, for people. Um, we also underperformed as we look at healthcare and our ability to um, stockpile lab supplies to, again, support that national response. Um, we lacked a lot of plans initially in regards to domestic manufacturing. So relying on the civilian sector to help us with things like PPE and other supplies. And then we really had, you know, compared to a lot of countries globally, we didn't even really have a plan on how to bring foreign workers into um, the U.S. as well for support. Um, and then the other last interesting that we do um, not so great on is, is guaranteed uh, paid medical leave. Many countries, um, as you can see, global average is 93, so pretty high. Many countries who um, not only have universal health care also have the ability to pay workers to stay home because they're ill. Um, we got a 50 out of 100 just because, yeah, we allow people to go home on uh, medical leave, but they don't get paid. And so that becomes kind of interesting when you think about compliance with public health measures during a pandemic event like COVID. Uh, when you think about, you know, people's ability to quarantine isolated at home versus their other priorities of, you know, trying to pay bills, take care of their family um, without some medical leave pay, that certainly makes those much more difficult. We certainly saw that uh, during COVID, some other willingness to stay home when ill um, just due to uh, competing needs in regards to economics for people. So risk environments, um, one of the, another category that we looked at, um, again, I pulled this one out, the US overall scored a 73, if you look at just the overall category. And generally the perception is the US is a fairly safe democratic country to live in. Um, but if you really parse that down further, um, because what this category really assesses for is your overall vulnerability to a biologic threat. Um, and it takes into consideration your political, socioeconomic, and security risks that uh, are present. 
It also considers your infrastructure, your environmental, environmental risks and public health vulnerabilities. And so if you parse this down even further though, again, looking at global average of 58 in these subcategories, uh, we weren't much above that in regards to political security risk, um, which looks at um, things like, um, you know, risk of terrorism, things like that. Um, our government effectiveness, again, kind of 66, so not a, a great, but what was interesting uh, when you look at this even further, uh, one of the biggest things that was detrimental to us for government effectiveness was public trust in the government or public confidence in government information. And what they have found when you look at um, risk in a, a, in a country as far as national security, the public confidence was actually more important than your, your emergency plans, operations, and response itself, uh, which I thought was quite interesting. Um, so those are just a kind of a couple of things to, to kind of parse out there. Uh, we certainly struggle a lot with um, some of our illicit activities, non-state actors. A lot of this goes back to um, a lot of the drug and gun uh, trafficking that goes across our borders what uh, is a lower score for us in that category. So certainly um, really illustrates the point that we, even though it's a very um, robust nation, do have some vulnerabilities in that regard. And then finally, we'll kind of just briefly tie up here at the end. I know I'm running a little long uh, with recommendations uh, that have kind of come out of uh, this particular uh, review, at least in my opinion, because um, regardless, when you look at the Global Health Security Index, there's not a single country right now that's prepared completely for future pandemics. We all have vulnerabilities, um, but we also face in the U.S. in particular competing political priorities, which makes oftentimes the recognition of public health as a kind of tenet of national security is there are things that oftentimes that are seen more pressing by policymakers. And certainly that is uh, something that's also conflicting when we start looking at trying to give recommendations for how do we do better next time. Uh, recommendation one certainly is investing in better warning systems and health intelligence. Um, you know, our warning and our ability to predict and respond is often very reactive yet when we start looking at uh, reporting systems and um, and certainly there's been a big push. There's some really good information and articles uh, put out from Nevada. There's a physician, Dr. Jim Wilson, who used to be, he was the first operations chief, I believe, for the Department of Health and Human Services. And he uh, has a civilian sector now, health intelligence um, uh, company, and they really worked with the state of Nevada and they did quite well with uh, warning systems and prediction and planning uh, everybody did poorly with COVID, but they certainly were able to kind of um, at least alleviate some of that in the front. And their big thing was early warning. And certainly that's part of President Biden's um, push right now is to get better at um, detection earlier and not being so reactive. Number two is kind of looking at the realignment of our pandemic preparedness response. Um, two things really stick out here. There's really significance when we look at fiscal neglect, uh, what's very common in after action reports, we look at large events like a pandemic. Um, there's this kind of panic and, and neglect cycle that happens. Um, we have an event, we, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of um, political uh, push for it. And then as that event fades, um, we kind of go back to our old ways and it kind of gets forgotten about till the next pandemic happens. Um, we also found that a lot of our response structure is not very operational, at least the, how it was executed anyway during COVID. Um, you know, CDC is oftentimes seen as one of the large um, players in um, disease outbreaks, but what they do, what we found that they lacked during uh, COVID was they didn't have large scale response capability. Um, they also did not have pre-approved national funding. Uh, it's the one other pitfall for us as the U.S. is like, we don't have this kind of existing pre um, designed uh, or designated, excuse me, uh, national funding. Uh, we rely on the Stafford Act, like we saw during COVID, which then brings in that those FEMA dollars. And um, that certainly was problematic too when you look at our response structure in that um, at one point during the response, the administration moved FEMA into the lead role. And FEMA is really good at disasters and emergency events, but they did not have any public health operational experience. And so you had a couple of our big uh, preparedness response players in kind of non-traditional roles and that certainly created some, some issue. Um, we also saw issues with the national security stockpile um, on paper, looked great, but um, certainly uh, did not work as, as illustrated um, in regards to lack of supplies and the ability to, to logistically move them. And so really, you know, looking at 
building uh, public health preparedness like a military focus, you know, flexibility, logistics, and continuous readiness, I think is really key there. Um, we look at establishing and strengthening private uh, public partnerships. Um, again, not a lot of involvement in the private sector for um, uh, exercises, but certainly we saw a lot of promise when you think about operational warp speed um, in regards to developing vaccines, developing medical countermeasures. Um, so I think there's a, a big push here where we can um, improve our relationships with the private sector to deal with some of those supply chain issues and deal with um, vaccine and, and you know, hopefully more research for antibiotics, things like that, that are going to be needed in future um, pandemic events or infectious disease outbreaks. Uh, the last three here, um, certainly we need to look at rebuilding our public health infrastructure, uh, particularly the informatics side of it. Uh, there's no question uh, COVID really um, unroofed a lot of pre-existing public health deficiencies, and a lot of that's just due to, again, prioritization by um, policymakers and these continued budget cuts that have been occurring over the last number of decades. Um, but they need more staff, they need more funding, in particular regards to preparedness funding. And that was one thing that's been the alarm bells being sounded for over the number of years is we need more funding for preparedness. And that's a really difficult um, piece for political makers, policymakers, because it's not a popular topic when you're trying to put money towards an event that may or may not happen. And it's something that's not visible. Preparedness is never anything that's visible to the community. And so it's hard to really get political support for that, but that's needed. Uh, if we're going to uh, get our public health infrastructure and workforce to the point of being able to respond to the next pandemic, which will happen. Um, number five, um, looking at healthcare and strengthening abroad, um, certainly as President Obama said, you know, global health security is, is our national security. And I think that is really important that we invest abroad to strengthen local healthcare systems, strengthen um, public health infrastructures, lab capability and detection. Um, China is certainly doing some of this uh, with kind of their belt and road initiative, which they've been building infrastructure across Africa in particular. And they're kind of using healthcare as kind of a soft version of power um, to kind of win hearts and minds, if you will, of locals um, to gain some political, geopolitical influence uh, from their standpoint. And then lastly, we need to look at our own U.S. healthcare system. Um, the way our current delivery, finance, and governance model for the U.S. is set up is certainly not surprising to anyone who's been involved in healthcare, public health, that public healthcare access is difficult. Um, and we need more of a flexible, agile sort of public healthcare system that can deal with surge capacity better, deal with the supply chain issues we had, um, and more importantly, um, access for all, and then be able to share information between the medical community and public health. There's some really, uh, really big things because there were a lot of vulnerabilities obviously exposed within our healthcare system during COVID. And then lastly, we'll just kind of summarize uh, this whole talk because I know we're running long on time here. Certainly over the last number of decades, and lessons learned, we can all agree probably that there are a lot of unmet needs yet for the U.S. and our global public health infrastructure needs. Um, we remain underfunded, underappreciated oftentimes in all levels of government when you look at public health from a security standpoint. You know, they want us today when they really didn't supply us yesterday kind of thing. Um, the difficult thing that we face now, now COVID is kind of still around, but not to the prevalence that it was during the pandemic um, peak, is there's certainly many more complexities of national security in a traditional sense that a lot of the priorities of our policymakers are certainly focused elsewhere already, like what's going on in the Pacific region with China, Russia, and Ukraine. Um, so it's going to make um, a little bit more difficulty in regards to policy um, for getting more funding for uh, health security, which is my fear at this point. And then certainly over the last uh, three years or so, we've certainly again re-highlighted the need for action at the federal, state, and local levels in regards to good public health policy um, that actually uh, moves forward in um, getting us to a level of making a public health a central point of national security as it, as COVID has certainly illustrated it needs to be, and not so much more of these kind of panic and neglect cycles where a lot of interest now, but then that fades over time. And so those are just kind of, again, some basic opinions I have overall. We certainly could go into this topic a lot more in depth over probably many um, weeks of a, of a course, but I'm going to stop there because I know I'm a little over time. And if there's any questions, I certainly can hang around for those who have the ability to uh, stay behind and I can take some questions.
thank you so much for such an incredible presentation. Um, just such an important topic. Um, we just really appreciate you taking the time to, to present for our DPH seminar. So thank you so much. If anyone wants to stick around and ask some questions, please feel free to throw them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, and we will we will get rolling with a few questions. I guess I have a question. Um, I, I, I listening to your presentation and, and my background is is, you know, working for a center that focuses a lot on immunization education. But I wonder, too, what how does the this impact to when you think about public trust? Um, I think about, you know, with vaccine hesitancy and how that impacts um, like uptake. Um, so is there any plans or, or things going in place to address misinformation and how that might impact um, the outcome of some of these particular measures and, and, and how you can roll them out to the public too? Yeah, I think, um... That certainly has been a concern. You know, the, the DOD really tried the, you know, carrot and stick approach initially. Like if you didn't get the vaccine, you were, we're going to kick you out. Um, that certainly was met with a lot of contention resistance. Um, and that didn't work. Eventually they rolled back. So, okay, fine. Um, I do think that misinformation is certainly a large, large piece of vaccine hesitancy. And I think a lot of that goes back to risk messaging and um, kind of the point of, you know, early on, those were some of the big um, kind of tripping points for the U.S. is a lot of, um, we saw the policymakers really, you know, sparring with our medical experts. And, and that was, a, I think, a, that really set the tone for any other information that came out. And so I think real early and accurate information, because um, developing public trust in the government, honestly, right now is probably one of our biggest hurdles. Uh, when you look at vaccines, whether you look at any sort of health information from the government, I know it's a really big uh, focal point in President Biden's administration in regards to his um, his biodefense uh, policy plan was to address some of that um, misinformation. Um, I don't have specifics for how that's being done, but I know it's a really important talking point now that people are looking at and trying to make sure our risk communication is done well, because that really sets the tone for, um, you know, whether it's vaccines or you know, whether it's, you know, whatever is next that's needed for medical countermeasures, there's going to be a lot of skepticism. And um, so I don't know the specifics, but I know it's definitely something that's on the radar of, of people involved in that. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Well, thank you so much. This was such a great presentation. And thank you everyone today for joining us. Um, we will be posting a recording of this session on um, the College for Health and Human Science um, YouTube page. Um, so I hope you all have a fantastic day. And um, thank you so much. <laughs>